And just so everybody knows that the meeting is being recorded. Okay, great. We um, always begin these meetings with public comment. If there's anyone in attendance who has anything that would like to speak to uh, that is not an item on the agenda, we'd be happy to hear it now. Um, if you do, please give uh, give us your name and your address. Um, Mark, let's verify first that we do have a quorum, though. Oh, um, sure. Are, are any of the unnamed people, Greg Dimbrin, DC, by any chance? Greg is on. He's chatting computer, too. Oh, is it? I just can't see it. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, yeah, it says nice. East Hampton. Okay, let me rename you. Okay, sorry. Go it's ahead. Reese, Reese. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Us, are we set? Yes, we're good. Can you hear me? Can you Maybe hear you me? Figure out how to turn my camera. Yes, Janet, down. we can hear you. Oh, good. I would um, like to make a public comment when it is time. Okay. So um, I just uh, mentioned the first item on the agenda is that our public comment period. So, um, Janet, if you are one of those individuals who'd like to speak to something that is not on the agenda, um, for the benefit of all those in attendance, if you could please just state your name and your address. Janet Gross, 38 Round Hill Road, Northampton. Great, thank Recently. you. Okay. Yes. Recently, I received a link to Northampton's new historic preservation plan and thus far have merely skimmed it. However, the plan's cover featuring Clark's Gaywith Hall raises a number of troubling questions. Why, for example, are the City and Historical Commission advertising the Clark School? Do you really believe Clark conveys the City's rich heritage and character? Surely many of you read the articles that appeared in the Gazette in early January of 2019. For over a century, Clark students were intellectually, emotionally, and physically abused. And no wonder, oralism, a now discredited pedagogy to teach the deaf to speak and read lips while forbidding the use of sign, and championed by Alexander Graham Bell, reign supreme. Additionally, Bell was a eugenicist whose influential memoir upon the formation of a deaf variety of the human race appeared in 1884 and along with oralism quickly came to dominate both the Clark School and deaf education throughout the nation. In further deference to Bell, Clark made an effort to keep boys and girls separate during free time. Skinner Hall and Shop for Boys, Coolidge for Home Economics and Girls. Clark likewise followed Bell's advice and after his death established the Clarence W. Barron Research Department, financed by the fundraising of both Barron, then president of Dow Jones and Company, and Calvin Coolidge. Staffed largely by Smith College faculty, the research department remained in existence for more than 20 years. Yes, oralism was a given, and thus the department accomplished little for deaf children. Please note that in 2020, both Stanford and Indiana universities removed the name of their former president, eugenicist David Starr Jordan from campus buildings. Though somewhat obscured by Bush's, Alexander Graham Bell Hall still remains in tall aluminum colored let letters at 45 Round Hill Road. The historic preservation plan also references the 2022 Clark Historic District proposal as approved for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. That report funded, I believe, by the current owners of the Clark property and developed by Tanya Merrim of Epsilon, Epsilon Associates in Maynard, Massachusetts, is profoundly flawed, as I demonstrated in a critique I submitted to the state. According to Ben Haley, director of the state's National Register, the report had been paid for, approved, and thus stands. 
which certainly makes one wonder if anyone bothers reading official documents. And finally, there is the Clark campus this decade, owned since 2013 and being developed by an aggressive Springfield gang. Despite all the city and historical commission have done to fulfill the developer's wishes to include historic restoration tax credits, withdrawal of an ordinance for a once required buffer between a business and residences, approval of pickleball courts. Please note that from January, from September 3rd through 6th, employees at check writers played pickleball on those courts, courts that lack any noise remediation from dawn to dusk in recognition of National Payroll Employees Week. Plus, there are now two tall signs that all but say, keep out, and the daily roar of gas-driven mowers and blowers. So too, address numbers are yet to be found on either side of the extensive property. Vehicles to include large FedEx and UPS trucks now wander aimlessly up and down 20 foot wide Round Hill Road and too often search private drives in hopes of finding a specific locale. But aimless wandering and faulty deliveries aside, what happens if, when there's a fire? Fortunately, Captain Patrick Davis of the fire department says he's working on it. We await the outcome. And yes, there have been several fires at Clark throughout its history, though the most spectacular on a summer night in 2016, when neighbors gathered at Gaywith Hall, gaping at the conflagration before them, as it dramatically reduced some of Northampton's most significant buildings to rubble. Properties that once housed the Round Hill School for Boys and the Round Hill Water Cure and Hotel. And now today, 45 Round Hill Road, AKA Bell Hall is up for sale. Does the Historical Commission know this? A large brick building plus over two acres of land and priced at a mere $2.1 million. I'll spare you my conjecture regarding its future and certainly hope the Historical Commission will prove me wrong. Gay with Hall, meanwhile, as featured idyllically on the cover of the Historic Preservation Plan, can hardly be viewed as an architectural or historical gem, nor does it convey the city's rich heritage and, char and character. Rather, it is a symbol of the devastation perpetuated by the Clark School for over a century, and that unfortunately still lingers to this day. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. As always, we appreciate your um, comments and um, they will be recorded. Okay, the next item on, unless there's anybody else who has any public comment. I don't see any hands, so we'll move on. Um, I have a very brief chair's report. Um, First of all, um, I wanted to just let the commissioners know that we have, we meaning the commission, AKA Sarah, uh, has put together an application for community preservation funding uh, for this coming round um, to work on the inventory, specifically the accessory buildings, meaning outbuildings in the city, which have not been inventory. So that would be the, um, the project if it comes through. Those applications are in and um, they'll be reviewed in the fall. Uh, the second is that um, the a group of us continuing to work on the Florence National Register nomination project. Um, we had to kind of put our effort on hold during September because um, Michael and I who were working on it were both away, but we will get back to work on that in October and we will report back as we move along. And thirdly, um, I wanted to just announce that we do have two new members who are gonna be coming on. And I'm gonna ask Sarah to give a little bit of a uh, overview of the, who those folks are. Um, actually, I'll defer to Barbara to, um, for the historic Northampton nominee. Oh, okay. This is Hannah Ray, who actually, since I'm 
freshly back on the Historic Northampton board, and she is also on that board. I don't really know her that well, so I don't know what kind of information you have. Um, I know that she has a great interest in this, and uh, just from talking to her, I think she's going to be really good. But do you have more specific information about her? I apologize that I don't. Uh, I do not have it handy, um, but I. Uh, she was enthusiastically recommended by. Right, Lord and she has a low. She has a a business in town on West Street, yeah. um, in the newly renovated um, buildings right at West and Green Street. And one of those is her business, is the design business. And um, so I'm really pleased that Historic Northampton, uh, you know, nominated her to replace me on the um, Historical Commission. Right. Thanks, Barbara. And um, well, we'll talk about this at the end of the meeting. Just we're going to miss you. But um, and you Sarah, know, I might lurk, you know. <laughs> you're always welcome. I know that. And Sarah, do, uh, the other member is? Uh, Douglas Thayer, who's a, a local builder. He owns property on um, Locust Street. Um, and he just has a general interest in, in history and was looking forward to participating in the commission. Yeah, Douglas, I actually know better because he's done a <laughs> lot of work for Historic Northampton okay. um, in the renovation of the barn and in um, fixing up the... Uh, the one of the other houses, the Damon House and the Damon Basement, where a lot of items, collection items are stored. And he's just really, um, you know, it's one of these people that thinks outside the box and says, well, I'm going to find you, um, I'm going to sort of recycle some shelving for you or do this and retrofit it. And he just created all sorts of things and saved historic Northampton a lot of money doing it. So he's, I think, again, he's going to be great just with his his eye for architecture and for um, uh, he, he's going to be a real asset to um, the historical commission as well. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you, Barbara. We're really looking forward to um, adding to our composition. So let's look forward to. Okay. Um, that was all I had for the chair's report. So uh, we will move on. The next item is approval of minutes and we don't have any minutes. So we will just go right to the continuation of the request for the LHD certificate of appropriateness um, for the project at 197 Elm Street. That is parcel 31A-039. And if all of you remember at our last meeting, there was an initial presentation made about this and we asked for some um, follow-up information, did not make a decision at the time. Um, so it looks like Stephen, you're here. The I construct yeah. and the property owner, I see Jeff. Great. Um, do you wanna give us an overview of, um, you did submit some additional materials, which we have. Yes. Um, would you so like to do that? Susie, can I just ask either Sarah or somebody to share that just because it'd be helpful for me to look at it while we're talking about it? Sarah, can you do that or do you want me to? You're muted. Uh, yes, give me just a, a couple okay. of minutes. So just to remind everyone, um, this is the project to remove an existing uh, small accessory structure that's been used as a pool house. Uh, we believe dates to around 1920 um, and replace it with a new um, similar sized building, which would serve as a, a accessory dwelling on the property. Um, construct is the contractor for this. They are moving the, they're planning on uh, putting a new building within the existing um, setback, setbacks that apply to this property. And, um, my memory is the concern, one of the concerns at the last meeting was that um, the pool equipment was going to be visible. It looks like you made some effort to address that. So why don't you um, walk us through this and help us um, figure out what the changes are and hopefully right. illuminate us more so we can make a decision. Yep. Um, so Thank as you remember, the last time we did, we discussed that, the uh, the pool equipment and also the uh, windows and doors, which actually it turned out were on this. There was a schedule on there. We just didn't note it. Um, it. It's now increased in size so we can see it. 
As you can see here, this is the existing floor plan. Oh, here's the window and door schedule. They're gonna be mar Oop. <laughs> Actually, there is one small little um, thing that isn't on here, which is a, there's a, a small structure. Michael might have that if he's available that goes on the back for the pool equipment. I will say that pool equipment is um, very quiet. If, if mine was as quiet as that pool equipment is, I never would have mind mo moved mine into a shed, but that's beside the point. Um, but there is now a, in line with the back structure, a um, hopefully maybe it shows up a little later in the plan here. The next page oh, right there. there. Right there. This page here. <laughs> right there, yeah, exactly. You see a, a 12 by six foot structure, which stays within the setbacks and it'll be gabled just like the, the existing structure. So it'll be a continuation backwards at that. The windows are, once again, there's Marvin Ultimates with the white aluminum cladding exterior and wood interior. The door is a, would be a, a wood door because they were gonna have a fur ceiling inside. So we want a fur interior on the door. Um, the floor plan really hasn't changed that much. Oh, there we go. Nice elevation there of what happens with the back, that structure. So the pool equipment will go in there. The, I should say the pump will go in there. The heater obviously will still have to remain outside because it, uh, it's an air unit, heat pump unit, excuse me. Um, if you continue on, Michael did do further elevations of the, that was the other concern that we didn't have enough pictures showing what it would look like from the street. That's the existing structure as it is there now. And he did some renditions on, on one of the, yeah, there we go. So, and I don't, I don't have the capability of making those bigger, but I know Michael can, if you, if you really want to see them. Um, These just need to be zoomed if, if we can zoom in and out on this image. Okay. Uh, so this, the first one in the upper left is obviously standing in the pool yard itself. That's the completed structure. If you go to the, to the next one, you can see that's where, where it will be moved to. And the, the third one is the, I'm going of course across the top to the right is how it sits on the property with the fence. And obviously the other one is from high above King Street, number four. Number five is to the neighbors to the right. The neighbors on the walls, I think it is on Crescent Street. Number six is farther down that property line. Number seven there is in the pool. <laughs> Interesting view. Uh, standing inside the yard here. Um, and the third row here, the one that's from the neighbors, but that fence actually is a little taller than that. The fence determined that fence is five feet now. Actually, that's a four foot fence drawn. Um, and let's see what else we got here. And I think if you continue across, those are from the neighbors yard. I can't see up. And this is Mrs. Big farther back from like the parking lot, pop, the neighbor to the behind walls of the next unit, that multifamily might, might get there for that view to the last one on row number three. And can we scroll up? If anybody's got any questions on it. And number, the first one is from Elm Street. Obviously you're really not seeing much more than what we currently see. I don't think you're seeing any more quite honestly. With the vegetation, there won't be any view in that spot there no they were definitely not um so the other so the last two three are kind of the most visible spot from elm street so it really isn't that any more visible than what it was to be honest with you other than the only difference is that um slight extension for the porch the building itself the main structure is identical in size to what was there Thank you. Um, do commission members have questions for Stephen or Mike Michael about this? And 
If not, um, I just want to remind everyone what what we're considering here according to <clears throat> our design standards. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about all this, but these are the items that we need to consider. Uh, one is the site. Is this uh, structure going to be um, compatible with the character of the site? The scale, is the scale of the bu building um, meld with or complementary to existing buildings? The massing, proportion, height, shape of the roof, window patterns. Again, are those compatible with the character of the district and the other structures on the property? Um, materials, which I think Stephen has um, been clear about. Architectural character and details. And so those are the things you should be thinking about. Um, I think one of the challenges, I guess I'll just state this up front and others can weigh in. And I think one of the challenges is, is of this is that um, it's not so much what's being proposed for uh, the site as a replacement. I think it's the loss of the, the building itself. And that's something that we have uh, responsibility to keep an eye out for and um, take care of. So um, one of the things that I think would be um, good is if there was any consideration given to could the structure be relocated? Well, actually, yes. And it turns out Michael, my designer, we're going to disassemble it and he's going to use it as part of his expansion at his house. Unfortunately, that's in Vermont. It's not in town, but it is, oh. it is going to get reused. So, you know, disassemble it will be at a larger cost to the customer as opposed to just crushing it and throwing it in the dumpster. But that is the plan. Okay, well, that's a, a reasonable re um, response. What do um, other commissioner members think about this? Well, I, I, went, I went by the site today and as I was looking at the structure from the outside, I thought, <clears throat> I thought to myself, well, it's kind of a sweet looking affair. Um, it's, you know, it's quirky, but it would be nice to find it at home. So I'm delighted to hear that that's the case because that's really my only reservation. I think um, the uh, the drawings that we've seen are very responsive to the questions we raised, and and I'm pretty comfortable with where things stand otherwise. So um, it sounds like a lot of good things have happened. Great, Greg. I've got nothing to add. Okay, so don't disagree or agree. Just, okay. How about you, Barbara? Well, I agree with what Michael said, and um, I'm, you know, again, it's makes me, you know, halfway happy to know that the building's going to exist somewhere, even yeah. if it's not in town. But I just, I, I noticed that Marissa is here at the meeting, and I know she had some things to say. Are we going to? I'm hoping that we'll ask her if she has something to say about the additional structure at the back to put hide the uh, contain part of the pool uh, stuff. Yeah, definitely. That was next on the docket. So if, there are no other comments from the commissioners. Um, anyone from the public who's in attendance who'd like to comment, um, we'd be happy to hear your thoughts. And that includes you, Marissa. Marissa was a, was a commission member a long time ago. <laughs> but she's not speaking up. So, okay. Anybody else? Well, if there are no other comments, um, can you oh, hear me? Marissa, are you speaking up? Yeah. yeah, I don't, yeah, don't think I, I didn't, I was okay. muted. I didn't know. I thought I, I couldn't figure it out there. No, uh, no, I, I'm very happy to see that the application now is, is a full application in detail, which is, you know, what I, I know the commission looks for. So thank you for that. And, um, yeah, and I, uh, yeah, I'm interested to see what I know my other neighbor, I don't know if she's here, was more concerned with the uh, the equipment in the back. So whatever you say about that will be interesting to see. Uh, you know, I just want to add for further any kind of application to the district as a, a builder. Uh, you know, it's, it's not just Elm Street in this case. 
the rules have always stated from a public way. So when we're building it, it this would be Crescent Street would come into play here too. It doesn't, it's fine. There's a lot, you know, blocking it and all, but I just, you should just know that, that, that uh, it's from a public way when you have a building. Uh, and, uh, and I know you keep saying it's not visible. I agree with that, but I just want to say, you know, you keep saying it's not, you don't, you only see this small, maybe you see it in your elevation. It's barely visible from Elm Street, but that's not really true. If you stand on Elm Street, I pass it all the time. You stare directly, you can look wide open space at that building that you're going to remove. So I'm not quite sure why you say it's not visible from Elm Street. Um, you can look right straight through the yard and see it. And that's all, but I, you know, I, I hope it, I'm sure it'll be fine. And, and I like my neighbors and I hope that this works out uh, for them, but I'm glad to see a good application. So that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Marissa. Oh, so I would like to correct one thing. I don't believe I said it was not visible from Elm Street. I believe what I said was the view, I mean, from Elm Street, excuse me. I believe what I said was the view is not gonna change dramatically from the current view. Okay, maybe it was last time it seemed that and, was. And, Okay, that's fine. Thank and you. I did, and I did circle the neighborhood on all the cross streets to make sure it is not visible from any other street because that is something Sarah had expressed a concern with. Okay. okay. Yeah, and just so to clarify too, because it's in the district, um, we have to um, assume that there's a possibility that that uh, if there are fences or signs or other stru accessory structures or any kind of planting. Um, those could go away. And so um, we want to, we, we need to review this, uh, assuming that it's visible, basically. But we did, so we're good. Okay, um, if there's no other comment, I would entertain a motion to um, award a certificate of appropriateness for the project. Would anyone like to make that motion? I will make that motion. Okay, Greg, second? I'll second. Okay. Either one, take either one of them. <laughs> All right. Um, another comment? Then, sir, we should vote. Okay. Uh, so, roll call vote on certificate of appropriateness. Michael? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Greg? Yes. And Martha? Yes. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, um, Stephen and Jeff and Michael also for um, being so responsive to our comments from the last meeting. It was very helpful. This additional work was um, important and- I understand. I think a good response, re result. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, all right. Okay, uh, moving along, um, our next, item on the agenda is a, um, a determination of significance pursuant to the demolition ordinance. Um, this is the property at three and five Clark Avenue, map by G 31D-222. Um, this is um, the first step in a demolition uh, review. And that is just at this point to determine whether we, in our opinion, this um, property is significant. Um, and if we do determine it to be historically significant, then, then there would be a public hearing to determine um, the future of it. So um, all of you received the information, the B form for the property. Uh, this is the Julius Phelps house built in around 1850. And um, it sits kind of right at the entrance to downtown, which I would consider to be an entrance to downtown, um, right below the bridge on South Street. Anybody have any comments about it? Or thoughts? Well, it is in a pretty prominent location. And I mean, I went to look at it, even though I knew exactly where it was and what it was. And But I went to look uh, yesterday just to take a closer look. Um, and I think it's even across from, oh gosh, I can't think of it. The one that's, <laughs> I can't think of the name of the house. I should, the Clap Pollard was known as the Clap Pollard House. And it was one that's on the corner. for a long time. Now it's a private residence. It's right across from it. And, um, you know, unfortunately, a house across from it um, 
further down where the convenience store is was a um or what am I not seeing it? Am I not seeing this correctly? Maybe it's farther down. Anyway, the, uh, uh, if you look down this to the end and you see a White House, there used to be another White House next mm -hmm. to that, which was removed once. And uh, the, here's the, the Clap Pollard is a sort of, not Victorian, but like complicated Queen Anne um, house there with lots of facets and stuff. So I feel as if this, uh, I think I, when I was looking at the criteria, it was maybe C and D that I felt really made this um, a significant, historically significant house uh, because of the age. I believe it still has its slate roof, the these two chimneys, um, and being where it is. It's sort of part of the streetscape too, which unfortunately is losing pieces. So um, I'd hate to see this one. And even if they are replacement windows, they really did, at least I think on the, uh, you know, the upper floors, they're not, six over six anymore are they now that i'm looking at this picture i thought yesterday they well maybe i was looking at an earlier picture i apologize anyway i i would say that just for its uh, its age its appearance um and its location that it is significant great thanks barbara um greg i agree with barbara um uh, you know it is right in the wheelhouse of the historical commission um, in the house. I'm trying to understand, are they looking to uh, level it and rebuild? Are we privy to know that? We, um, we, we can know, we can be informed about that, but it, it, at this point we're, we can't use that to consider, um, okay. you know, whether we think it's historic, it's significant or not. It's not part of our purview, but we certainly can have that information. I think, Sarah's real up in the air, air at the moment, right? What they're planning on doing with it? Yeah, the, it didn't sound like there was a, a pending demolition. Like potentially, they were looking to um, market the property and and have some options available. You mean there is no demolition application? So the, it, this is a zoning permit application, which is pretty typical of um, how the commission gets these. A, a full demolition application has to include a, a, you know a, asbestos and lead abatement and all sorts of things. Um, right. So we typically get these through a zoning permit application, okay. which sometimes okay. property owners will use to get the mm -hmm. clock ticking. Right. Okay. Um, Michael, you have any thoughts? Well, uh, I I agree with Barbara and Greg. I would hate to just um, uh, pass on this. It seems to me there are so many features of the house that making intriguing and its location. Um, and I guess I don't understand. So the, the idea is that this application, if somebody wanted to sell the place, it would be sold with the commission's approval that it could potentially be demolished. Is that sort of, does it make it more saleable? Or, or like you said, something about expanding options. They're not necessarily applying to do a demolition immediately so there's no particular plan is that is that what do I, am i so, understanding that yeah and so often yeah. when the when the commission receives uh applications for demo it may not be that there's you know demolition is impending um property owners are generally aware of the potential one year delay requirement and will often factor that factor that into any potential plans uh -huh. also a, a very deep lot i did go back and look at it um so there's a lot of land behind it that abuts the parking lot the municipal parking lot um but i agree with with all of you i really think this um it's not only the house it, the structure itself it's it's context that it just that row of um structures really does um convey you know sense of northampton history and you know you you come to it when you're coming up south street and you arrive and you are sort of told you know this is a historic place um these people built these buildings a long time ago and they were intended to be here for a while um i think it just really marks the character of the city and i 
I think it's really it's significant just in that respect. Um, Barbara did note that the slate roof is still intact. Um, the chimneys, the house looks like it's in good condition. I don't know about the interior, but it doesn't matter. So I, um, and I know Dylan was able to weigh in on this um, by email and he was very strongly in favor of um, supporting, uh, keeping the building, not, um, well, determining it that it's significant. Yeah, that's what it's like. So I would agree with all of you. Um, so what that would mean is if we vote to say that it's significant, then we would they would come back, right, Sarah, in, an, um, in the next meeting, and we would have a discussion about a demolition delay. Correct. Yeah. So we would schedule a public hearing where we would consider additional um, evidence, including the condition of the, the building. Um, yeah. And, and have okay. a discussion with the applicant. Okay. So um, if there's no more, just, does anyone uh, who's attending the meeting, not a commissioner, want to comment on it? And if not, um, we will I'll entertain a motion to um, determine that this is significant. I, I would move to find, and <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's three to five Clark Avenue, um, significant. And I'll second. <laughs> Either way. Okay. Sarah? Okay. Roll call vote. Michael? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Greg? Yes. And Martha? Yes. Okay. So um, we don't have other items on the agenda um, that are listed. Does anybody have anything else they would like to bring up at this point? Okay, I, and just, actually, I do have I do have one question that if sure. um either or one of either or both of the new members were appointed before the next meeting, mm -hmm. um would they if they watched the recording, would they be allowed to vote or participate in the public hearing and then vote? I mean, oh, on uh, if I weren't here point. at that meeting, if I weren't a member of the commission anymore. On on the Clark Avenue item, Barbara? Yeah. So this isn't part of the hearing. The, the determination of significance can actually be done um, according to the ordinance, either by um, a subcommittee, which is, has been typical, oh. or even by staff. Right, um, I know. So oh, so it doesn't... Starting from scratch. At the, oh, okay, the... great, great. Okay. Um, okay, so a couple of things. One is... Um, we will continue to work on the Florence National Register project. Um, Michael, we'll be in touch to talk about moving ahead with that. And then second of all, I just wanted to, and also um, Greg, you're going off Barbara, so I won't even ask you, but Greg, if you have any interest in working on that with us, you know, please step forward and say yes, and we'll um, figure out a way to get you involved. It's so uh, we just happened to offer to do this, so. Um, we're happy to have help. And then just finally, Barbara, I want to thank you so much for um, your service to the commission, to the city. You've been amazing. And I think the commission will be, um, you know, there'll be a big hole. We'll be, we'll be missing you a lot. You've been um, such an advocate and always thoroughly prepared and very articulate in your responses and thoughtful. And um, I'm I'm gonna I personally I'm gonna miss that a lot. I've really enjoyed working with you all these years. It's been great. Well, the the same um, I could say about you. And you know I'm glad to do it. I just figured twenty years. You know somebody else should yeah. should get some new blood, new ideas, and uh, yeah. So, um, and particularly since I went back on historic Northamptons board, it's been sometimes a little tricky to be on on both uh, boards and commissions. But thank you very much. I've I've really been glad to do it. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Barbara. All of your your time and and efforts on 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 everything the commission has done, and and particularly on the right. preservation awards. And, and I will um talk to Hannah about maybe I'll get her to take over the um the, the historic preservation awards um because I've seen I've noticed a couple projects around um the city mm -hmm. that maybe could qualify you know they're pretty recent and they have been nicely done 
So, and then, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll try and get her to take that, that mantle. That would be great. Yeah. We look, and I look forward to meeting her and to meeting Douglas as well. So oh, is um, there, are there any, is there any thought to making the historical commission meetings in person again? We did that for a bit. Yeah. Um, I don't know, it was sort of in the spring, right, Sarah? It was in the spring, we had a few meetings in person. Yeah, we did. Um, they, it was a little awkward because people were on Zoom and then some people were, were in the meeting. And then um, I, I think due to mostly travel schedules, we started meeting mm -hmm. remotely again. Yeah, and I think with um, when the preservation plan was getting finished up too, I know Judy is across the state, so getting her here it's difficult. Um, I mean, she's. It would. It's easier. For, would it was easier for them to participate remotely. I don't know. I mean, we could certainly talk about it again. I'm not opposed to it. I do a lot of these meetings in the public realm, and um, I do think that the Zoom approach is. Um, it it allows a lot more people to participate because they don't have to travel downtown to join in, and it's also great for consultants who are not. Um, in Northampton who are far away and have materials they need to present, which are easy to do um, virtually on a screen. So I think there's sort of pluses and minuses. I don't know, Michael, Greg, do you have a preference about it? Honestly, it's 50-50. I mean, I'm still here working and I'll be here for another couple hours probably. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But if if there wasn't this wasn't virtual, you would have to pick up and come downtown and yeah. So well, for instance, less... I'm not I'm not sure Michael and I have ever met face to face. Have we, Michael? Or was I... there one meeting where we were together? Well, there were <clears throat> meetings that I sat in on before I became a um, oh, okay. member of the commission. Yeah. But, but no, we haven't actually had because yeah, I think in particular with new members coming on, it's really nice to to meet in person, at least initially. Yes, once or twice. You know, if you I need to switch to Zoom, but getting yeah. around downtown is not going to be fun. What's that with what? With all the new construction coming, getting around downtown is not going to be fun. No. <laughs> Good um, point. But I, I will. I I agree with you, Barbara. Um, I I think maybe we should think strategically about having um some meetings in person for the very reason that you. Uh, you, you mentioned, and given the constraints with open meeting laws and things like that, you know, we have to be careful that the venues where we are assembled are um, appropriate. So, yeah, I think we should think think about it um, from that perspective of coming together as a group, um, if only occasionally or a few times or whatever, to, to do a little bit of um, team building. It's a good point too. So maybe when, um, sir, do you have any sense that the new members are going to be approved by the time of the end of the month? We, and the city council's I believe they, busy. They should be. Um, yeah, they, they should be by then. Um, okay. If, so if they haven't maybe, been sworn in, they can't participate, but they would still be welcome to come to a meeting. And, and Yeah, and Michael did that, as he said. Um, I would encourage them to do that. So maybe, um, you know, once we have them on board, that would be a good time to have have a live meeting. Yeah. And yeah, and I think that would, you know, be wise so we can meet each other. It's interesting, Barbara, you say that about never meeting people face to face. I mean, I've done entire, you know, very comprehensive long projects with people in this last five years with communities or clients where I never meet the people face to face. And it's the strangest feeling. You know, you're in, involved in the intimate workings of their municipality or organization or whatever, and you never actually see a physical face. So it's kind of strange, but it's kind of also kind of the world we're in these days. So. Right, right. But we are all in the same city. So, so true. Very it's true. Different. So at least yeah. once in a while, it'll be nice. 
Anyway, yeah. on that note, I have to leave to get ready for my next Zoom. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Barbara. Barbara. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, and I'll, you'll probably see me next month. You never know. All right. Okay. All righty. You will. Bye-bye. Michael, are you going to say something? I was just going to follow up with, um, to reiterate a little bit of what you were saying, which is that Zoom meetings can be very f effective ways of bringing in people that otherwise it's difficult for them to participate and also being able to um, present materials and get the kind of professional input we need. So, I, you know, it's a balance, but I think if we could pick a meeting that doesn't that doesn't seem to scream out that it needs to be a Zoom meeting, that would be great. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. Okay. But, um, we'll have to figure that out. Would that out. be possible, Sarah, do you think, to anticipate that ahead of time? Yeah, yeah, depending on the agenda, right? On agendas. Right? agendas. I mean, so now, for example, we have um, a public hearing on October 28th, which may lend itself better to a, a Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, we can certainly play it by ear or, or plan something. Or okay. if people just want to meet to say hi, we could also do a site visit or, or something else. Yeah, oh, that'd be great. Good meeting. That's a good idea. That's um, great. One thing that I know Steve, I got a Steve Strymer, I got a um, message from this afternoon and he still wanted to schedule the Florence um, tour. Mm -hmm. And that might be something we could do, invite the new members to come to that. I don't know. Even if they're not officially members yet, and we could meet them and, and do a little tour of Florence. So I can ask them about that. Yeah, I think I think that would be a great idea. Okay. Um, I, you know, personally, um, I think the project is really interesting. I think that... Uh, um, I think it's a, it, you know, doing a walking tour with Steve would be a great way for people to just casually interact and yeah, and, yeah, that'd make a lot of sense. Okay. Um, let me, let me get back in touch with him and see, you know, what times are good for him. And, and then I can get back to you, Sarah, with some dates on what would work and you can sort of, we can sort of do a, um, Google poll or whatever they're called. A doodle yeah. poll. Do yeah, okay, that sounds great. All right, good. Um, well, if there's nothing else, does anybody have anything else? We um, will I, I, I should, um, I want to let you know that, uh, so I will probably be in New York City for the first three weeks or so of November. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know when it's confirmed, but um, my brother's going to do the transplant thing. Um, probably go in next week, which would put me in New York City for a few weeks to help out. So um, that would probably be November. So just to let you know, that's my right. schedule. Which so doesn't mean that I can't, I can't be doing things. It just means I will be remote during that period. Yeah. Right. All right, good. We'll wish, we'll wish all the best for that too. Yeah, I love you. Okay. Um, then I will entertain a motion to adjourn and we will reconvene at the end of October. We don't have a quorum, so we'll just oh right. Just first. <laughs> okay. I guess um, Martha, did you want to talk a little bit about next steps on the Florence thing? We can. Can we do that on this mean, Sarah, this media, or do we need to go off and <clears throat> do it separately? Uh it might since we don't have a quorum anyway, we might as well just pick it up at a at a different meeting okay unless um actually did you did you do you two just want to chat was that the we could do that that would be fine can, is it okay yeah we can so okay. that we can adjourn the meeting and everybody else can okay yeah i just did i know it's on the the city zoom and i didn't yeah, know if there was some yeah nope. restrictions yeah, we, with that you can stick around all right okay so we are adjourned <laughs>